Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where in the world you are tuning in from. I'm Max Hegblom, Editor-in-Chief of FEMS Microbiology Ecology, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to this webinar on polar and alpine microbiology. We live in a microbial world with the global coronavirus pandemic making traditional conference attendance impossible, FEMS has launched a series of webinars to support the microbiology community during this time. These webinars will provide a forum for the presentation and discussion of key research, enabling the flow of ideas to continue despite the cancellation of in-person events. FEMS journals invest in science. As a not-for-profit organization, the Federation of European Microbiological Societies, FEMS, uses the income from our journals to fund our charitable activities and support our community, in particular, early career scientists. We sponsor a range of events, such as this webinar series, provide grants to hundreds of scientists every year, and present several prestigious awards. FEMS journals are committed to publishing high quality scientific research that is accessible and more easily shared across borders. Today, we focus on polar and alpine microbiology. Please note that this webinar is linked to the thematic issue on the topic in FEMS microbiology ecology, so there is much more to explore in the journal. Earth, polar, and alpine regions comprise a range of distinct habitats and ecosystems which share important and common traits. Their biogeochemical and ecological processes are mostly driven by microorganisms, which are extremely vulnerable to ongoing climate change. More than ever before, polar and alpine ecosystems are under threat, particularly from the loss of glacial mass and the thaw of permafrost. These changes offer some exciting, even disturbing opportunities for microbial ecologists as we focus on the roles that microorganisms play in exaggerating the rate of change and in responding to such changes. We have three excellent speakers today who will provide insights into the activities of microbes in Arctic and Antarctic habitats. Thulani Makalania from the Center of Microbial Ecology and Genomics University of Pretoria, South Africa. Lucy Mallard from the Department of Ecology and Evolution, University of Lausanne, Switzerland. And Nestle Hantash from Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, the Climate and Ecosystem Science Division in Berkeley, USA. After the uh, three talks, we will open the session for questions and discussion. So you can submit your questions uh, via the question link and we will then uh, have a joint discussion on all of these three uh, presentations and topics. So our first speaker, Tulani Makalania from the Center of Microbial Ecology and Genomics, University of Pretoria, will talk about resistance and resilience in Antarctic soil microbes. Uh, Tulani. Thanks, Max, for the introduction. Um, and thanks a lot for inviting me to talk about some of our work. Um, uh, just from the get-go, I want to start with the acknowledgements because of obviously the work that I'm talking about here, I did not do it alone. I did it through the collaboration with various colleagues, former students, and various mentors that have guided me through my thinking on Antarctic microbial ecology and uh, the, the various research topics that I've explored. So just by way of introduction, I am in the Center for Microbial Ecology and Genomics, as Max mentioned. Um, we have a diverse range of research topics, and just by way of brief introduction, we work on a range of topics, all the way from looking at the microbial ecology of South African soils, assessing the gut microbiomes of South African individuals, looking at the marine microbial ecology, principally of the Southern Ocean and waters linked to the Antarctic environment, and of course, looking at the Antarctic microbial ecology. So just before um, starting my preparation uh, for this talk, 
I think I went down a bit of a wormhole. I started researching all the previous work um, and looking at when the earliest papers on Antarctic microbiology uh, uh, were published. And I started first just by doing a Scorpus search. And what's shown on the top uh, corner, switch on my pointer. So what's shown over here is when I put in the search column, uh, looking, at, um, looking at Antarctica, and microbiology. And at the bottom is when I've used in the, uh, the search phrases Antarctica and bacteria. So what you'll see is that there's been a raft of research. I think I saw almost more than 3,000 research papers published under the, the topic. And the earliest paper that I saw in Scorpus, I could not get access to it because it's not published open access, was titled Antarctic Bacteria. And this was in 1921, published in the Lancet. Um, what all these papers have in common is that the early microbiologists assumed that Antarctica, uh, because of the extreme environmental conditions, is unlikely to support any type of microbial uh, microorganisms. In fact, this paper that I've uh, copied here um, the authors report that none of the uh, soils that they collected from the Ross Island displayed evidence of any type of coliforms. But things have changed dramatically since then. So over the passage of time, so starting roughly from the 1960s up to now, people have explored various questions. So there's about five thematic issues which people have covered. The first, people have explored how the diverse soils um, in Antarctica, uh, how diverse uh, microbial communities are in Antarctic soils. They've explored what the effects of the nutrient status or the oligotrophic conditions and how they impact on the microbial uh, diversity and microorganisms in these systems. And most of these studies have tended to focus more on bacteria and fungi. They've looked at whether these microbial communities are actually functional or they're just vestiges or DNA that, that's present in the environment but not actually undertaking or providing any ecosystem services. So people have also explored um, what the community composition is in these uh, soils and they've tried to understand more what the trophic hierarchy is within, within these systems. Very recently, um, as Max has mentioned, because Antarctica is undergoing such extensive changes, a lot of the recent studies have started to look at how climate change impacts on these microbial communities and the ecosystem services that we derive from them. So there's been lots and lots of different papers over these, uh, especially the last 30 years or so, but virtually since the 1960s. And the key summaries are summarized more in sort of five points is that people have more or less come to a realization that Antarctic desert soils have substantially higher levels of diversity than previously thought, despite the extreme environment. At least at Farnham level, people have seen that the microbial diversity is similar to the diversity found in other global soils. They've noticed that there's a high degree of endemism within these communities. And this endemism is quite visible when you look specifically at genus and species level. They've also uh, seen that there's uh, widespread evidence to carry out a range of different, uh, uh, the, the sequestration of a range of different um, elements, including carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus. And people have also noticed by comparing the metagenomes or stress response genes in Antarctic systems, that these systems seem to harbor for, uh, uh, comparatively higher levels of stress response genes compared to other systems. I think there was a global um, a survey that actually saw that when you look at stress response genes, Antarctic micro, 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 uh, soil microorganisms tend to form their own cluster and they have relatively higher abundances of several stress response genes. So Antarctica, of course, is 
a romantic topic. Everyone is very interested in anything that happens in Antarctica. And there's been a raft of very recent media articles looking at specifically the fact that Antarctica is undergoing change. And the fact that the, as part of this change, it has uh, uh, consequences, not only just for Antarctic systems, but for the rest of the world's climate. So I, I copied here just or, uh, a few articles that have been published in the last three days, which shows that despite the fact that uh, we undergoing a pandemic, people are still very much interested in terms of understanding what happens in Antarctica. So what I've shown here is um, uh, a map of continental Antarctica. And on the right uh, displays what um, uh, a, a, a depiction of the predicted um, temperature increases over Antarctica. So predicting the increases of temperature in Antarctica is quite complex because there's uh, complexities related uh, um, to um, the, the, the Air, uh, looking at the uh, complexities also introduced by the fact that there's lots of sea ice that make it very difficult to be able to accurately predict how uh, temperatures would change with the passage of time. But what is clear and what you can see from this figure is that at least in the coastal areas, there's likely to be very dramatic changes in terms of temperature. And these, change, these changes in temperature obviously have several several consequences. So what's shown on the left and highlighted in, in um, red is our sampling environment or the area that we do most of our work in. A lot of people may not know that Antarctica is, of course, it's an ice covered continent, but there's substantial parts of Antarctica that are ice free for parts of the year or all parts of the year. And these parts of Antarctica demonstrate or are characteristics of desert soils that are found in any kind of desert globally. Um, and you can compare them to very hyper arid deserts that are found in hot environments. Recently, uh, there's been a review that was published in Science Advances. And in this review, the authors tried to more or less synthesize the effects of temperature increases and how these temperature increases are likely to um, impact on biological responses in Antarctica. A lot of the findings, of course, are looking at macrofauna, uh, the characteristic charismatic macrofauna. And what they've um, more or less noticed is that, of course, we're increasing the temperature, there's likely to be more uh, snow and ice melt. When this snow and ice melts, it's likely to increase the amount of available water that's available in, in that, that gets then passed on to soils and permafrost. And this water is likely to cause the mobilization of uh, nutrients, surface nutrients in soil. And it is likely to increase the area that's available for microbial colonization. So increasing temperatures are also an inc and, and reduced desiccation as a result of these changes are likely to also lead to increased productivity and population growth uh, and, local and, and variations in local distributions. They've also uh, more or less noted, uh, predicted that, uh, or just by looking at the literature, that what most studies seem to show is that the increasing ice melt um, as, uh, is likely to lead to a depletion of nutrients, likely due to the dilution effect of all this new water becoming introduced into these systems. And that's obviously going to have consequences on especially microorganisms that are in these environments and the ecosystem services that we derive from them. So changes in the nutrient regimes around Antarctic soils are likely to lead to substantial changes in the key ecosystem services. So two examples, uh, we're likely to have very different rates of decomposition and nitrogen cycling in Antarctic soils. So a lot of the synthesis that I've shown here relates mostly to 
findings uh, from studies that have been done on macrofauna, as I mentioned. And very few studies have actually assessed the impact of this environmental change on microbial communities. So there's various reasons for this. It's, we all know that my, microorganisms are quite numerically abundant, even on, in Antarctic soils. And this makes it very difficult for us to understand their specific responses to environmental change. We know that when we look at microorganisms, there's always um, uh, underlying horizontal gene transfer, gene loss and conversion evolution, which makes it difficult for us to be able to disentangle the relationship between the traits that we derive from microorganisms to their, uh, for, to their phylogenetic structure. We know that because of the varied environments um, in Antarctica and in different systems, that environmental conditions have a disproportionate effect um, um, on a specific environment. So if we were to look at what the consequences of uh, climate change would be um, in a one square kilometer radius, you might have different findings depending on where you look what the nutrient dynamics are in that particular environment. So one of the things that have always interested us is we've always looked at uh, cold desert micro uh, desert uh, soils as sentinels to be to being able to understand the effects of these environmental changes on microorganisms in Antarctic environments. So this is where we work. It's not only a beautiful environment, which is probably why I show the picture, but as you can see, the environment is free and devoid of any higher plants or other organisms. So it makes it a very unique and tractable uh, model system to be able to understand the effects of environmental change on microbial communities. So in trying to think about how we understand and um, study the effect of uh, environmental change and disturbance on microbial communities and the ecosystem services that we derive from them. We've followed um, an appro approaches that others have des described previously. We've looked at the effects of disturbances. In this case, the disturbance being climate change and how it's likely to impact on microbial communities. So people have proposed before that microorganisms may display three, um, um, uh, three responses to how they respond to ecological disturbances and that they may be resistant to change and that the communities would stay more or less the same. They may be resilient to ecosystem change and that they can quickly bounce back to their original composition. And that you might have in microbial communities, a high degree of functional redundancy, that there are lots of, of course, of lots of microorganisms within these environments, and there's a high degree of functional redundancy. So even if there are some changes in some taxa or reductions or species loss, that the function, the, 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 the high degree of redundancy would mean that the functions that are performed by the microorganisms essentially remain unchanged. So using these frameworks, we went about looking at trying to understand the impact of temperature um, uh, changes on Antarctic soil microorganisms. So I will talk briefly about the first study that we did, where we looked at um, the effect of these changes on a taxonomic level. And then I'll also talk about the, uh, the, 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 the follow-up study that we did where we looked at trying to, um, to look at the effect of these changes on a functional level. So in the first study that we did, we essentially set up an experimental warming manipulation. We took soils from the Antarctic dry valleys. We set up a random block experimental design and we subjected the soils to sustained and prolonged warming over a 30-day period. So what we observed is that 
after 30 days were inter those 30 days I should mention were interspersed with intermediate sampling, a destructive sampling of microbial communities at different days to see what these changes were, whether there might be phylogenetic changes in the structure of these communities. We also measured the activities of several extracellular enzyme uh, enzymes to see if if there are any changes, whether these changes would be accompanied by concomitant increases or changes in the functional processes um, in, in these communities. So what we observed is that we actually did not, contrary to our prediction, observe any clear changes in microbial communities after uh, subjecting these communities to warming, right? We warmed up the soils to about 15 degrees and we could not see any types of um, uh, structural changes within these communities. There are some taxa, um, especially when you look under lower taxonomic levels that appear to change, but overall at phylum level, the microbial communities remained unchanged. When we looked at the extracellular enzymatic activities, we measured a range of different enzymes related to carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus acquisition. We noticed that the activities were rather stochastic. So in some enzymes, I show um, at the bottom phenol oxidase, which increased and um, decreased over the 30-day period. None of these changes were statistically supported. So we see that the, the, the community, the microbiomes, seem to be responding to changes, but these, these changes are not, necessarily, are, are not necessarily reflected in drastic um, um, changes in the phylogenetic composition of the micro, mi microbes within these communities. And so overall, we just, we observed a lack of any kind of observable change in um, um, different measures of uh, microbial diversity. And also, we, we did not see any kind of change when we looked at several different extracellular enzymatic changes. So the combined results um, led us to come to the conclusion that microbial communities in these systems display, uh, to some extent, functional redundancy, and that they are, uh, are, are rather highly adapted and resistant to short-term changes in temperature. So what we wanted to understand at that point is whether we may be missing um, the actual changes that happen because we are trying to look at these uh, shifts at broader taxonomic levels. And what we did is in the follow-up study, that's the paper that was published in FEMS, we tried to probe um, using a functional marker, uh, functional markers to see whether the changes that we observe on a taxonomic level or that we did not observe on a tax taxonomic level may actually be found by look, we might see those changes by looking at um, um, uh, 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 amplicons or genes related to ammonia oxidizing bacteria. So in this study, what we did is we set up roughly the same uh, type of study. So rather than in the, in the previous study where we didn't observe any changes after 30 days, we restricted this to about a 30 day period and, and um, also measured, measured the, 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 the activity of several extracellular en en enzymes, uh, more or less the same enzymes that are related to carbon, nitrogen and phosphorus acquisition. We looked at amplicons, so functional gene markers related to ammonia oxidizing bacteria and also archaea, which didn't quite work out, um, which is why we did not uh, go into detail um, about these results in the study. And we also measured um, microbial biomass and tried to see if we see any discernible change in biomass. So what's displayed uh, down here is that you see that just after we initiate the, 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 the warming, that we see very widespread shifts in microbial biomass. 
so drastic increases in biomass in and this increase is in both the the, the soils that we we kept mis, uh, uh, un, unchanged and also in the elevated soils you see a drastic reduction in microbial biomass but towards the end closer to the 30-day period we observed again like an increase so we had more or less like a drastic reduction in biomass but towards the end to the towards the latter end the microbial communities in terms of uh, biomass uh, uh, appeared to return to the initial amounts. So we also measured um, several uh, uh, nutri uh, soil uh, physical chemical uh, uh, analyses that are related to nitrogen. So we measured nitrate and monitored ammonium within the soil. So we at each point where we took soils to um, do gene specific probes, we actually measured how ammonium levels and nitrate levels changed um, and with these we did not see much of a discernible change between the soils that were kept at zero uh, compared to those that the where the soil was warm to 15 degrees but when we, we looked at soil uh, ammonia we actually saw that the 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 the, the Microcosm, microcosms which were um, applied or had simulated warming displayed um, um, more or less a stable, uh, uh, um, more or less stable levels of um, um, soil ammonium, whereas we had increases in soil ammonium in soils that we actually did not subject to any kind of change, which suggests that there might be some kind of um, um, uh, build up in soil, ammonia, in soil ammonium in these soils that were kept unchanged and that soil ammonium gets radically uh, used up as you start to warm the temperatures within these microcosms. So when we looked at the uh, accompanied um, activities of extracellular enzymes, I show here three key enzymes um, related to phenolic oxidation and peptide hydrolysis. You, you see that as we applied warming, you see uh, drastic increases in phenol peroxidase and phenol oxidase um, in uh, soils that had the temperature warmed up to 15, 15 degrees. And this is the same when you look at soil, uh, the activities uh, related to leucine aminopeptidase, where you see drastic increases that are also statistically supported in those activities. So what we try to do as well is, of course, I mentioned briefly earlier that what we wanted to do is look at ammonia oxidation um, functional uh, uh, drivers. So we initially looked at MOA genes um, um, of Archaea, and that didn't work out, as I mentioned, because we had um, um, uh, as a result of this uh, sequencing, most of the reads that we got for, 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 for the RKL sequences could not be annotated within, within the known uh, 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 databases that are used for functional annotation. But what we did see is that um, although we got lots of uh, operational taxonomic units that were assigned as MOA similar to those observed in bacteria, most of these were related to nitrous spira, and a high proportion, probably about 50% uh, of sequences, were related to a more, uh, uh, MOA uh, genes um, that were previously reported from clone libraries from Antarctic soils. So we could not actually um, assign those MOAs at lower taxonomic levels. And what's shown in the plot on the right you can also see that when looking at the MOA uh, genes, the fun MOA functional genes, that you do not see much of a shift in, MO in the relative abundances of these MOA functional genes at uh, baseline and elevated temperatures, except um, when you look at day 15, where you see an increase in the diversity of functional genes that are related to um, ammonia oxidation. So what we also tried to do is to understand 
um, looking at the soil physical chemical variables, which, drive, which factors um, drive or explain the structure of microbial community. And what we saw is that soil pH, total available uh, carbon and nitrogen, and various um, proxies for uh, nitrogen explained a high proportion of the variability that we observed um, in, in the structure of MLA um, functional, functional guilds. So in summary, the combination of the studies that I've spoken about, looking at um, microbial community responses at a taxonomic level, showed that these, uh, uh, um, at least the responses to warming of microbial communities on a functional level may uh, indicate evidence of functional, functional, high functional redundancy and adaptation and resistance um, within these communities. So of course, um, the, the, the caveat to all of this is that these are not long-term sustained uh, warming experiments. They are only short-term uh, changes in warming. So we've also seen from the, um, the functional studies looking at ammonia oxidizers that higher temperatures appear to elicit immediate uh, changes uh, and decreases in the, in the, in the microbial biomass. I've tried to provide evidence that when you look at uh, these microbial biomass shifts, they seem to also be accompanied or they coincide with um, associated increases in the activities associated with several extracellular enzymatic um, assays that we measured. So when we looked at the functional um, shifts of MRA and bacteria, we noticed that a lot of the variability that we observed could be uh, explained by changes in the total amount of av available carbon within um, the systems that we looked at. So together, the data that I presented more or less get a, gets us to a conclusion where we can um, 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 predict that higher temperatures in Antarctic soils, in Antarctic soil ecosystems, will likely, at least in the short term, lead to a reduction in the amount or the viable uh, amount of microbial communities in uh, cold desert soils. And there is also evidence that these changes in the amount of viable biomass may be accompanied by concomitant shifts in the ecosystem services that we derive from these microbial communities. So with that, I'll thank you all for listening and I'll get back to Max. Okay, thank you, Tulani, very much. Uh, you can uh, present questions in the question box and we will get to them uh, then at the end of the session. So from here, we go to the Arctic and Lucy Mallard, actually we're gonna stop in Switzerland or on our way to the Arctic. So Lucy Mallard from the Department of Ecology and Evolution at the University of Lausanne is gonna discuss biogeographical patterns in soil bacterial communities across the Arctic region. Lucy. All right, hello everyone. Um, can you see my screen? All right, excellent. Yeah. Um, so thank you for being here um, and listening to me today. And thank you, Max, for inviting me for the seminar. Um, today, I'm going to um, talk about some work that was published in FEMS um, in 2019 with some extended analysis I've done since then. Um, and all of this work was conducted during my PhD as part of the Marie Curie ITN called uh, MicroArctic. I'll just put my pointer on. There you go. Okay, so it works. Here. Um, so first of all, why study uh, microorganisms? So in the Arctic, as elsewhere, um, they play key roles in nutrient cycling, and they're involved in the release of climate active gases such as carbon dioxide, uh, methane, and nitrous oxide uh, into the atmosphere. And as a reference, uh, methane is 20 times more potent than CO2 and nitrous oxide is 300 times more potent than CO2. 
Arctic soils are um, special because they have two main layers. The permafrost, that's frozen soil and is estimated to store over a thousand petagram of carbon. And the active layer, uh, which goes through freeze and fall cycles and is estimated to store over uh, 500 petagram of carbon. Because this is the following layer and it's close to the surface, this is where a lot of the microbial activity and cycling occurs. And in comparison, um, as a reference, the atmosphere holds about um, 750 petagrams of carbon. So now you can imagine the issue of the falling permafrost combined with the increased microbial activity releasing all of this stored carbon to the atmosphere. So I've gone a bit on a tangent here, but it's just to give you a clear idea of where we stand and of the questions we actually need to answer. So when I first thought about my project, um, what I wanted it to be and the implications it could have, um, I asked myself some um, very basic questions like who is there, um, what microorganisms and how they're distributed and what is driving this distribution. And these might sound like very basic questions, but we did not really have um, any clear answer at the time. And this is the basis if we actually want to model spatial distribution in the region and then try to predict and understand what may happen in the future. Um, so this is the basis of biogeography. It's the study of the distribution of biodiversity across space and time, and it gives insights into ecological mechanisms such as speciation, extinction, dispersal, and species interactions. Um, there's still many aspects of those as that are quite difficult to investigate for microorganisms. Um, but this has been studied a lot in ecology for many decades, but mainly focusing on macroorganisms, so um, from birds to mammals, um, insects or fish. But it's only been 15-ish um, years since biogeographical patterns for microorganisms have um, started to really be described. And it actually really started with the development of molecular tools. Um, before this, it was believed that microorganisms were uh, more or less ubiquitously distributed. Um, and since there's been quite a few studies coming out and showing that it's not the case. So here are some examples um, of such uh, papers that came out in 2006. And when I checked the literature for some of the answers to the questions I mentioned before, so like who's there and where, I realized there wasn't really any Arctic study answering those questions and depicting this. Um, so since I started working on this topic of uh, biogeography, there's been a few global studies um, that have come out, and they're investi investigating the global distribution of uh, fungi, for example, but in my case of interest, um, of bacteria across the globe. But there's always a lack of Arctic samples. Um, so here are the two figures uh, from those two papers. Um, and here you can see a clear lack of Arctic samples with only two in Alaska. And here the same thing with just a few in Scandinavia and one in Alaska. And that's really something uh, that's missing because the Arctic is one of the fastest farming region um, on our planet and it's storing large amount of carbon. So if we don't take that into account, that, that's a problem. So this is essentially the gap I wanted to fill by investigating Arctic communities. Um, and this is what I'm going to talk about today. Um, so biogeography, it's been hypothesized that biogeographical distribution is driven by two types of processes, um, stochastic, such as drift, and deterministic, such as selection. Um, and then a range of other processes in the middle, like diversification and dispersal. Today, um, I'm going to focus on um, selection through environmental factors and dispersal through spatial factors. And while we know that environmental factors do influence community structure, um, quantifying the contribution of each of those remains a major task. But if we can actually do this first step, then we could eventually predict the spatial distribution patterns of um, soil bacteria. Um, and then if we want to go further, we could even eventually link it to um, functional processes across ecosystems and evaluate the potential consequences of future environmental change on ecosystem properties. So the aim 
the aims of this study were to um, identify the environmental factors structuring communities across the Arctic region, um, determining the spatial distribution of bacterial communities and um, whether we have biogeography, and then quantify the contribution of both the environmental factors and the spatial variables to assess the influence of selection and dispersal. So the overarching aim was to characterize the biogeographical patterns in bacterial communities in the Arctic. So to do this, um, we conducted some soil sampling, trying to cover as much ground as possible in the region and by trying to have samples from every Arctic country. So in total, we had 43 sites. Um, each was 100 meters squared and with generally five samples per site. So we came up with 200 soil samples. Um, on each of them, we measured conductivity, moisture, total organic carbon, and soil pH. Um, do keep in mind that we wanted something rather um, standardized, um, and these are often variables measured in other studies, but also those four variables, um, they've been shown to influence bacterial community elsewhere, so that's why we use those four. Um, so then we extracted the DNA um, and did 16 sequencing. Um, on the 60s RNA gene with the earth microbiome primers. And again, this is for standardization. So the interest here is that um, you can see there's still some um, gaps on that map. So there's still large areas of Canada and Siberia that aren't really covered. So by using the standard protocol from the earth microbiome project, then um, other studies could complement these data sets and it could also be integrated into global studies, for example. Um, so in total, we had uh, 386 DNA extract because we extracted in duplicates. Um, then we processed everything using Chinese usage. So in addition to describing the overall bacterial communities with the aims I cited before, um, I also got curious about um, abundant and rare taxa. So I wondered if those uh, abundant and rare communities might respond differently and whether we could see differences. So in nature, the total bacterial community is composed of abundant and rare taxa. And those with abundance less than 0.1% of relative abundance are characterized as the rare biosphere, and they represent a large and diverse pool of taxa. So you can see it here on this rank abundance curve um, taken from the Lynch and Neufeld paper that came out in 2015. Um, here we can see that there are very few abundant taxa, and then there's a long tail of um, rare microbes. And those ones can be a very vast functional gene pools, and they can be used by other microbes as a resource to respond to disturbance events or harsh environmental conditions, which can, which can be very useful in the Arctic. Uh, but they may also play um, essential roles in ecosystem functioning, disproportionate to their abundance. So they may be rare, but they may be very important anyways. So first we differentiated those communities. So here we identified uh, 48,147 OTUs, and of those only 134 were considered abundant. And that's over the whole data set. Um, and the rest were all just rare taxa. So here it just highlights that long tail of rare taxa that we saw in the graph before. Um, and in terms of com community composition, this is how it compares. So since um, the rare community is only 134 um, taxa short of the total community, it's actually very representative of the total community. So they're very similar, of course. Um, but when you look only at this one, the abundance, you can see that it's massively different. Um, and you have very large abundance of acidobacteria, for instance, or varicomicrobia, and the whole plantomycete uh, phylum disappear, um, essentially. Um, so then one of our aim was to evaluate the influence of the measured environmental factors on community composition. So we use the Adonis function, and here um, all the variables we measured had a significant impact on community composition. But the influence of soil pH on communities was quite different. So for the abundance, 
it explains 50% uh, of the variation in community composition and with overall 37% unexplained variance. Um, while in the rare, it explained only 17%, uh, but that's actually still quite a lot for a single variable, but with 73% uh, of the variance remaining unexplained. So then we evaluated the changes in community dissimilarity with geographic distance, and that's uh, we use distance decay curves because they're usually used to evaluate um, the dispersal limitation distance and also to determine whether there is a um, biogeographical distribution. So here, um, when we zoom in here in the zones, um, we can see that both the abundant and rare communities disperse to approximately 20 meters only. Um, and that's the distance when the curve um, starts to plateau. Um, we also do see an increase um, in dissimilarity with distance, uh, and that's a sign of biogeography. Um, but what's also interesting is that the abundant community is more similar throughout, so about 50% of the community um, on average is common. Well, for the rare taxa, you only get about 20%, so 80% remains similar um, throughout. But it's still there's still quite a lot of variation. Um, all right, so now we know that selection with the environmental factors and space with the geography influence community composition. Um, so we wanted to quantify how much each of them uh, influence community composition and to assess the influence of selection and dispersal. So here you have um, the Venn diagrams of the communities. So X1, the pink here represents the environmental variables, so pH, um, TOC, moisture, and conductivity, while X2 and X3 represent the spatial factors. Um, here, those are called uh, distance-based Morin's eigenvector maps, and for those who might know, they're equivalent to PCN vectors. So for the abundant community, the environment only, so the pure environmental element, explain 28% of the variation in community composition, while the spatial variables um, explain about 8.5%. What's interesting here is the overlap between the environmental variable and spatial variables, because those um, are spatially structured environmental variables, and they basically represent the environmental gradient. So these gradients explain 38% of the variation. In the rare community, um, the pure environmental effect is 14%, um, while the effect of space actually remains fairly stable um, to approximately 9%. And that's quite interesting as well because it suggests that the influence of space only, which is essentially dispersal limitation, seems to remain stable whether um, you're rare or abundant. So what seems to have the most influence in general is the environmental factors and the spatially structured environmental factors. And so it really highlights the effect of space and the importance of uh, assessing it. So with a pure um, space effect that remains stable, we could explain um, over 70% of the variation in the abundant um, community composition and less than 40% of the rare community composition. So it does suggest that um, there's still quite a lot of unmeasured factors that might influence uh, community compositions that we haven't yet measured. Um, so following this, so previously we saw we identified pH as the primary variable influencing communities. So we wanted to um, further like dig down into it and investigate further. So we evaluated how the communities change on that pH gradient. So first, we classified um, the sites into three different categories, um, so acidic, acido-neutral, or alkaline soil. And we looked at the distribution across the samples. So it ranges from um, less than four to up to pH uh, about nine. So we have quite a nice range of that gradient. Um, and as you see here, most regions have more than one pH uh, category. Um, so when we tested the differences 
between pH category and community composition, uh, we did see differences. Uh, but one interesting is that, as we saw the increase in acidobacteria in the abundant community with increasing pH, we actually saw the inverse pattern here with a decreasing acidobacteria in the rare community. Um, what we also see in the abundant is a decrease in actinobacteria with increasing pH and a decrease in varicomicrobia. Uh, in the rare community, we observed an increase in uh, bacteria deets which are here, and an increase in chloroflex I with increasing pH. So to further uh, investigate those differences, we wanted to see if we could identify clusters of samples and whether they may group regionally. So first, uh, with the PCOAs here, we can clearly observe the clustering of the samples by pH range, and there's a horseshoe effect due to the pH gradient. So the acidoneutral and alkaline communities um, appear closer, more similar than the acidic communities. And then we um, further observe this on the heat map and then run, which show the acidic cluster, so all of this. Um, here, very different from the rest. And then we have the acido-neutral cluster, um, and then the acido-neutral and alkaline cluster. And we, if we put this map, um, the acidic cluster includes samples from Norway, West Greenland, and Alaska. Uh, mainly, the acido-neutral cluster includes samples from East Greenland, um, Svalbard, and Iceland. And then the acido-neutral and alkaline clusters, so this one, um, include the samples from Russia and Canada. So it's quite widespread. So throughout the study, we characterized biogeographical patterns and the factors driving this distribution. But then uh, we still wondered if out of these 48,000 OTUs, we could actually identify a core microbiome of taxa that would be ubiquitously distributed. So we analyzed the total community here and we looked for OTUs present in 95% uh, of all the samples we analyzed. Um, and we actually only identified 13 OTUs filling this requirement. Um, they represented 2.2% of all the reads and they were principally classified as uh, proteobacteria and acidobacteria. And mainly the most abundant one was um, in the alpha proteobacteria. And as you can see, even though they're ubiquitous, their abundance did uh, change with the pH gradient. So I'll just summarize a bit our finding um, and reorganize things. So, First, we differentiated those uh, abundant and rare communities, and we showed that the rare community was representative of the total. But the abundant and rare communities were actually quite different from each other. Um, and this just highlights that long tail of taxa that I showed at the beginning. Um, so then we set out to identify the primary environmental factors structuring communities in the Arctic region. And we showed that all four measured environmental variables um, explained um, variation in community composition, but with different magnitudes um, between the abundant and rare. And one example was the soil pH that was quite uh, massive because soil pH explained 50% of the variation in the abundant and less than 20 in the rare communities. Um, so then we looked for uh, biogeography and we use those distance decay curves and these show the increase in community dissimilarity with increasing distance. So that's a sign uh, of biogeographical distribution and dispersal limitation. And this is well described in this paper if you want some further reading. Um, but what's interesting here is that both the abundant and the rare communities um, have uh, spatial autocorrelation, so dispersal limitation to about 20 meters only. Um, so when we evaluated uh, the contribution of both the spatial and environmental factors, so essentially um, dispersal and selection on community, we saw that uh, the pure effect of space um, was about 9%, but, and it was stable between communities. But the um, effect of selection actually quite varied a lot um, in the spatially structured environmental factors. So the combined effect of space and the environment explain a lot of the variation 
Um, so very broad conclusions. We did observe a biogeographical distribution influenced by both selection and dispersal in Arctic bacterial communities. And we found very low ubiquity in the region, even though we had a very high diversity with over 40,000 with use. Um, so with that, I'll just thank you for listening to me today. Uh, thanks to all of those that helped me out during the sampling, my co-author, my co Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Very interesting, nicely presented. I have lots of questions, but Excellent. we will move on and actually head to Northern California where Nestle Hantash at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory is waiting for us. And she will talk about insights into how comparative metagenomics uh, Provide or how comparative metagenomics methods provide insights into microbial carbon cycling and permafrost. So, nicely, Han, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So, uh, uh, today uh, I will uh, talk to you guys about a collaboration uh, between uh, University Ber of Bergen uh, with Lisa Aureus's group and Lawrence Burke National Laboratory uh, on a study that we conducted in Svalbard, uh, led by Yajin uh, Zhu, uh, a PhD student uh, at the time in Lisa Aureus's uh, group. So uh, following up on uh, Lucy's uh, presentation uh, and um, uh, providing a general overview uh, of the permafrost environments in the Arctic. Uh, I always have to remind myself that uh, how large the Arctic is and how much land permafrost actually covers in the Northern Hemisphere. That's of course has its own consequences, especially uh, uh, when we think about carbon stocks uh, that exist in these environments. Uh, Arctic greenhouse gas fluxes uh, actually comes from a large uh, uh, set of different and complex processes that is ma mainly mediated by the uh, microbial interactions, uh, providing a lot of feedback from a variety of uh, surface structures as carbon dioxide, methane, or nitrous oxide to the atmosphere. So the portion of the uh, Arctic soils that we know the least is the permafrost. Permafrost is this uh, locked up soils uh, that is high in uh, ice content that is overlain by the active layer, which is the topsoils. And uh, this uh, particular soil type is of interest for uh, many different uh, scientific disciplines. But of course, as a microbiologist, our interest is in the resins of the permafrost. So what we know about the permafrost uh, microbes is uh, uh, increasing every day. It's a very popular area of research. But what we know for sure is that every permafrost we look uh, looks very different, uh, starting from the uh, high Arctic uh, to uh, moving to uh, European Arctic, to Alaska, and portions of the Antarctica. Most of the permafrost had been studied all around the world and uh, reported today, has a different microbiome. Uh, and permafrost thaw itself as an uh, uh, event results in different types of landscape features. That's very important in the Arctic because it uh, utterly changes how the uh, soil moisture is distributed. So if the permafrost is in the high areas and the mountains under forests, and if it thaws due to various reasons, including fires, this results usually in drainage and uh, displacement of the uh, waters to elsewhere, resulting in uh, very dry, very depleted soils while permafrost thaw in the more flatter areas could uh, result in thermocarst lake uh, formation or start to grow ice wedge polygons in uh, coastal areas that even further uh, changes the distribution of the moisture in these systems. And this all can influence microbial composition and the activity. So of course the uh, uh, concern in there is with the permafrost thaw methane and carbon dioxide release will increase, heat will be observed, and it will in, uh, cause more uh, uh, temperature increases in the atmosphere. So this is the key that we're all trying to resolve, how much of this permafrost will lead to the uh, emission of greenhouse gases. Uh, but we understand uh, very little of 
life in especially in icy conditions. So when we look at our current knowledge, we know that the microbial metabolism is possible down to minus 40 degrees C. And uh, communities can grow uh, around that minus 20 C over six months period. And when we look at the permafrost metagenomes, there are clear differences in how carbon, nitrogen, and processing occurs when they're uh, in frozen state, when it's thawed, and when it's thawed, and uh, uh, soil uh, moisture uh, is uh, different. So that could lead into various scenarios of anaerobic respiration, methanogenesis, methane oxidation, and nitrogen cycle processes. And what scale we collect the data is also very important. Permafrost environments are highly heterogeneous and uh, complex ecosystems. And events at uh, smaller scales, like I'm shown in here in the aggregates, can have consequences at larger scales on the landscape. You can see different lake formations, different uh, uh, polygon uh, structures appearing, thermocars degrading uh, and moving soil into water bodies. Uh, this all has uh, different consequences for the general uh, carbon and nitrogen cycling processes. So uh, what we are collectively trying to do is the filling out the gaps in the knowledge uh, on understanding how permafrost microbial communities function and how they might function once uh, permafrost starts to thaw. What we know is that permafrost contains a different microbiome than the Arctic topsoils, which is also called the active layer. And we also know that the upon top permafrost microbiome changes significantly. So our current knowledge, uh, in essence, uh, quite focused on understanding what happens in uh, areas that uh, soil moisture increases, that uh, causes a formation of uh, thermocarst lakes or really saturated soils. From what we know is that uh, these conditions usually lead in depletion of oxygen, uh, emissions of substantial amount of uh, methane and carbon dioxide. But Arctic is large and have very, various different uh, landscapes from watersheds to uh, forests. And the relation between uh, methane, carbon dioxide, and other gas emissions coming from these environments under the uh, climate change scenario is a bit less un understood. So to uh, give an example, uh, today I will take you to Svalbard to uh, one of the uh, watershed features in here in the Advertalen, uh, or in English, I've learned very recently that it's also called Advent Valley, uh, that it's a very unique permafrost environment as it uh, stands at uh, the border of Arctic and Antarctic Ocean. Uh, so island is mostly covered with glaciers. The central uh, Spitsbergen, where uh, the study site is, it contains a rather young uh, permafrost from Holocene, but uh, Svalbard as an island has various uh, ages of permafrost. Uh, what really makes it very interesting for this location that is North Atlantic current uh, dampens the polar influence in Svalbard and especially for winter. So it is actually a warmer type of uh, Arctic climate for the remainder uh, of the region, which gives us a unique opportunity to think about the scenario uh, of a near future where all the Arctic is uh, gradually warming. So this study that I'm going to talk to you about today is a, uh, is a third in series of uh, publications that uh, started with uh, Lise Aureas's uh, uh, trip to uh, Berkeley many years ago, uh, funded by the uh, Fulbright uh, uh, that she received and very prestigious Arctic chair position, uh, came to Berkeley and we started to work on the samples that she collected from uh, her study side in the Advertale. And previously, uh, uh, Lisa's group uh, published uh, several uh, nice studies explaining how uh, these permafrost uh, uh, microbial communities are distributed uh, through this uh, uh, depths and uh, what are the uh, consequences of tow and uh, uh, happens to the uh, greenhouse gas emissions. 
a grad student, Yajin Zhu, joined my lab uh, uh, for a while to study a, a follow up for a follow up study to try to understand the microbial dynamics a little better. So uh, the samples were collected through drilling and um, initial uh, analysis was done through uh, here in Berkeley via CT scanning of these cores to understand their density. Then they were uh, subjected to sterile uh, subsectioning and, and nucleic acid extraction. And for today's talk, I'll just talk about the part uh, that involves the metagenomics and reconstruction of uh, genomes from these um, soil samples to understand metabolic functions and how we, uh, we went about trying to analyze them uh, systematically. Um, so the earlier work showed that uh, there is indistinct bacterial and archaeal diversity between active layer transition to permafrost and the permafrost layers in this location. As you could see in this figure, uh, microbial composition uh, strongly changes when uh, permafrost starts. But what was interesting is that when we looked at through the CT scanning, uh, there was an, a very similar density gradient from the uh, beginning uh, of the uh, soil core, top of the active layer, towards uh, very much up to two meters in depth. So that gives a, gave us an interesting contrast between very dense, uh, somewhat similar soil uh, uh, density throughout, but quite different microbial populations. So the aim of the study was to capture variances and trends in functional potential throughout the depth profile in here, uh, try to focus more on the permafrost than the active layer. And uh, by all means, this was uh, for us to explore the, uh, the content of these soils more than uh, trying to uh, test uh, their immediate response to the changes in the temperature. Uh, we hypothesized that uh, uh, phylogenetically related uh, genomes, and those are the metagenome assembled ones, uh, should reside in uh, permafrost. And the uh, microbial uh, metabolism represented uh, by this probably was a, a mix of aerobic and anaerobic processes as uh, you know, just been shown in many different sites. So uh, for this, we uh, took one active layer sample as a reference and uh, sequenced several permafrost steps ranging from the beginning of the permafrost going up to around uh, two meters in depth. So both active layer and permafrost soils in here were rather acidic and contained 1.3 to 1.7% uh, soil carbon. And they were uh, sequenced with uh, Illumina HiSeq uh, machine to you know, just get as much as yield as we could at that point in time. Um, to be able to get high quality uh, metagenome assembled genomes, uh, Ya Jinju uh, developed a pipeline where uh, he started assembling all the data available uh, generating uh, a distribution of high number of contigs uh, uh, scanning through different GC uh, uh, contents in here, um, binning and aggregating and further uh, refining them into uh, mags. So what we noticed in here that even after a use of uh, many different methodologies to get high quality mags, we were not really able to use all of our data in, uh, in a in a way that would be appropriate to the current uh, uh, standards. Uh, to resolve that and uh, refine further, uh, Yajin actually developed an, a pipeline uh, that could be added to uh, existing uh, workflows uh, that helps to uh, refine your uh, uh, metagenome assembled genomes further. So the idea is that uh, in, uh, we use uh, taxonomic annotations of each Contig in the bin and compare them to their overall uh, taxonomic annotations. So basically, what you would expect in a bin that is assigned to a uh, phyla level taxonomically, remainder of your uh, contigs sh should also be in the same uh, uh, taxonomic order. If not, that might be an uh, indication of a contaminated contig and you would like to uh, uh, remove it from your. Uh, uh, metagenome assembled genome. So for each bin, uh, 
uh, we calculated a taxa percentage in every rank. And in every rank, uh, uh, this particular script reports to you how uh, well that distribution is located in your uh, bin. It also generates and cleans up uh, your uh, uh, mags based on these cutoffs and reports them back at you. So essentially, you can use this tool to uh, di taxonomically dissect your uh, or further refine your bins, feed it back to the quality check, and check each uh, dissection one by one to see if this is what you would like to uh, report back or use in your analysis. It just gives you a quite a good flexibility to try to take a uh, 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 mag that otherwise would be discarded and try to uh, 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 refine it further. The uh, point in here is that uh, you could, you know, just do hundreds of these in a systematic way, in a fast way, and take the script and plug it into your own workflow. There are several other uh, uh, methods exist to do uh, this work, but that requires uh, using a, an already existing system most of the time. So uh, by use of this method, we uh, uh, generated uh, several mags and then uh, calculated their distribution along the permafrost uh, uh, depths. So in blue, you see the active layer as the reference and as the color goes darker, that's a deeper layer of the permafrost. What we noticed that the unique mags and what I mean by this is phylogenetically unique, it becomes more abundant with depth in the permafrost uh, in Svalbard. So uh, there are several phylum that it is highly abundant throughout uh, the depth profile, but it quite dynamically changes between different depths. Uh, by with, uh, with this knowledge at hand, we further uh, uh, analysis to uh, to take a look at the functional uh, potential in uh, these mags to try to understand if they were uh, what they were representing basically what we wanted to do in here that it is different than just annotating them and looking at their uh, uh, abundance uh, throughout to take a look at their coverage and develop a method that would take uh, each bin and each uh, biochemical pathways coverage into account so that for the bins and also pathways that we have high coverage represented throughout, we can assign them as important or well represented in different samples and could compare it across uh, different samples uh, by not uh, just taking a look at the bins individual abundance, but taking a look at uh, uh, biochemical pathways abundance. With that, uh, we uh, also generated groups uh, of uh, uh, similarity and differences uh, uh, definitions. So what we uh, were trying to f figure out in here is the answer of which are the most commonly found uh, biochemical pathways that's also having a high abundance and coverage throughout the permafrost or in individual permafrost layers. What we found out is that uh, almost 60% of the permafrost uh, uh, had similar functions. We didn't really uh, find a lot of individual to permafrost type uh, functions in here. And that comes from the fact that uh, some functions were shared between two depths, but not with uh, uh, but not only exist in one. So uh, depth profile and they are actually having uh, uh, shared groups that it is not really well represented uh, uh, between uh, individual samples. Uh, with this information in hand, we further uh, looked into what are the more important uh, uh, biochemical pathways that is involved in uh, material cycles, especially in carbon, nitrogen, uh, and the ones that lead into methane production. And in there, uh, what we found out in uh, shown in here in red when they are really in highly and abundant is that most of the uh, uh, carbon cycling processes represented in these uh, mags were actually aerobic. So you have ser series of uh, energy production uh, and uh, sugar utilization uh, pathways in there that is uh, coming from mainly uh, aerobic processes in here. 
and when we also looked at uh, carbohydrate uh, active enzymes, they were really highly abundant in all permafrost, and some of them were uh, even further abundant in the deeper permafrost that were regulated by really oxidative processes. And when we look at the uh, end of the uh, pathway, uh, to carbon dioxide production uh, potential, it was also very strongly represented in uh, permafrost, even in all or in the subdivisions of it. And that uh, uh, matched really nicely with the previous investigations done in these locations uh, in Ovrea's lab, that showing that in longer periods of time, uh, carbon dioxide uh, emissions from the uh, permafrost could be just as much as the one that is coming from the active layer when permafrost thaws. And there, were, there was a clear difference between aerobically or anaerobically produced uh, uh, carbon dioxide. Nitrogen cycle was rather limited in uh, uh, the mags and uh, Svalbard. We saw uh, full denitrification potential, but most of it was uh, focused on recycling ammonia within the system. There was very little nitrogen fixation potential. I think over the series of mags we generated, only one could do it. But uh, sulfur uh, reduction uh, was much better represented. Uh, interestingly, we didn't see any signatures for methane production or oxidation in this system, which is contrary to the general working hypothesis. Uh, transporters, stress response, and an antibiotic resistance was also very strongly represented uh, in uh, permafrost, especially transporters for ammonia and phosphorus uh, was really enriched. Uh, there, uh, there were several uh, antibiotic resistant uh, genes that has been also commonly and consistently found between different depths. So, uh, so all BART uh, uh, mags showed us that uh, mostly aerobic uh, uh, functions were enriched in this permafrost and uh, ammonium sulfur and phosphate metabolism was uh, potentially highly regulated. So that was an interesting finding for us coming from the assumption that uh, usually we think vertical uh, soil profiles as uh, aerobic zones transitioning neatly into anaerobic ones with depth. Uh, but this shows that the permafrost could be an exception to this one. And uh, the results that we show in the transporters uh, also indicates that uh, trying to get uh, nutrients and resources in a potentially competitive and limited environment uh, as a permafrost could be an, a key microbiome property that we would like to uh, take a, a deeper look into. So Svalbard in here provided a unique study area for a uh, coastal uh, permafrost. As I said uh, in the beginning of my talk, the Arctic is large uh, with permafrost from various ages underlying different ecosystems that require further studies. In here, we could show that uh, at, in a uh, watershed system, maybe carbon dioxide could be a, a bigger feedback to the ecosystem than the methane in contrast to more wetter uh, and uh, lake areas. Of course, anything in between, and even these findings need uh, further investigation. If you would like to take a look at the methods that we used for this paper, they are available in GitHub for you to take and modify and use. If you would like to take a further and deeper look into MAGS, uh, they are available annotated and uh, ready to use through uh, DOE's K-Base. Uh, you will need an uh, account for it, but that's just an uh, it requires an email and you can just take these mags and uh, you know just investigate them in the way that you would like to take a look at uh, in uh, different methods that KBase provides. And with that, uh, thank you very much for joining today and I would like to especially thank to uh, my group, uh, lead author in here, Yajin Ju, Inge Yonasen and of course, Lisa Ovreas, who enabled all this study, and our funding agencies as DOE uh, Fulbright uh, Arctic Initiative, uh, Research Council of Norway, and University of Bergen. Uh, and with that, I will return the floor to Max. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Nithihan, and actually thank you, Lucy, and to Rani as well. Uh, excellent, three wonderful talks and uh, we will open this up for questions. We have about maybe 10, 15 minutes.
And again, if we don't get to all of the questions, we'll try to uh, follow up on some of these then offline as well. So let me try to look at this and go on. Actually, while I'm looking for these, one question from me, and this has to do with assessing the communities in these soils and using the 16 sRNA data set. That's of course a gene copy number. And the operon number varies in different species, different phyla and so on. Have you tried to look at all in terms of how this type of a, a correction factor would change your community data of who's rare, who's abundant, if you then see that, yeah, it could be one copy, it could be five, six or more, more co gene copy numbers? No, that would be um, quite interesting, but no, I haven't looked into it. But yeah, for sure. I mean, this is a global study, but there's still a lot we could do um, from looking into what you just said to looking into uh, functions or um, trying to map their distribution. So there's still a lot of options um, from this data set. Tirani, have you looked at that with your data sets? No, we haven't, but I think you bring up uh, something that's quite important because what you ex would expect, um, not only would you see evidence of lots of different copies of 16S, but you'd expect that because of the extreme environment, you'd have a high degree of uh, duplicated genes. And we all just assume that um, what we see on a single co uh, copy, whether it's 16S or other genes, represents what we see in the environment. But that I agree, is not necessarily the, the case, and even more so in extreme environments. Okay, let me go through and check some of the questions. There's one here, uh, really to Lucy, how to classify abundant versus rare species? Um, so that's been done in quite a few studies recently, and the, there's just a threshold of relative abundance. So anything that's above 0.1% uh, is considered abundant, and you'll find it quite a lot. And anything that's below that threshold um, is considered rare. So that's just the threshold I used here. Um, I guess that's the most widely used. Uh, at some point, people need to make decisions. Um, but so that paper I cited, the Lynch and Neufeld uh, paper, is quite well described um, and really explains why they uh, suggest that threshold of evidence. But partly it's operationally defined, essentially. Yeah. So the other question, so why do you, would abundant and rare taxa respond differentially to, for example, pH gradients? Well, um, I guess, I mean, we did find um, similar response uh, in some ways, others different in other ways, but I guess um, if you're more abundant, you might uh, take more of the niche and that might define really how you respond. Um, yeah, um, I mean, because you also reduce the number of taxa, so here we only had 134. Um, those might be, you might be able to explain more variation just because there's less diversity um, in what you're looking at. So it's not necessarily that they might really respond differently, it might just be because we use that less taxa um, and then the response is just clear. Okay, there's one question for Tulani, but I think it also uh, will affect some things on the Arctic soil. So do the microbial communities form a protective crust of any sort? And if so, does short-term temperature warming affect this soil crust? Yeah, so there's uh, lots of different uh, type of, if the person is referring to type of biofilms, and we've looked at those. Um, most of these tend to be rock associated. Um, we haven't looked necessarily at the impact of uh, um, environmental change or soil perturbation or, or changes in temperature and other factors on these microbial communities, the rock associated communities, but you'd expect that they would follow uh, more or less the same patterns that you'd see in um, so-called open soil communities, because the communities that you see in these clustered communities or biofilms 
tend to be recruited um, from the open soil. So we'd expect that uh, the patterns that we observe in soil would roughly be the same in, in the uh, biofilm uh, or clustered communities. Um, from the sampling I've done, um, I didn't necessarily see bioprust in itself. So uh, we sampled mainly over the tundra. So we always had some um, plants, like small plants and some green around. Um, the only place where that might apply was uh, northern Canada. That was really high. There was no plant biomass at all. Um, and the soil was quite, um, yeah, I guess you, you might have had some um, soil crust, but I didn't do the sampling there. That might be an interesting thing to take into account, yes. Okay, and then one question going deeper. So the permafrost, uh, are they totally aerated or are there anoxic regions? Nestle Hanum, you were looking at the aerobic uh, yeah. activities and so on. Yeah. How does that oxygen really fit in? Yes, that's a great question. So uh, we actually do not know uh, the you know the true dispersion of air, if possible. But what we do know is that the presence of microsites. So as the ice forms, or you know, just it, it just locks them all up. So there is a possibility for oxygen to you know just lock up in these ice uh, uh, structures for a while at least. And uh, by the temperatures, of course, that. Uh, uh, oxygen uh, dissolving in liquid is a bit uh, higher chance than otherwise in the uh, normal temperate environments. But um, the interesting question in here, I think for us was, uh, for this particular study at least, is that the, to be able to uh, observe the response. So once the uh, ice block was removed, so when the samples were thawed, actually they were uh, you know, behaving very much like uh, how we would uh, observe them to do so, uh, if you just were to look at the uh, uh, microbiome data, yeah. Okay, thanks. And here's the question on functions. And again, are there functional differences between the abundant and rare taxa? Uh, again, would they have completely different ecosystem services? Lucy, do you know from your data set on what you could extrapolate on? Um, so we didn't uh, look at function. Uh, just because we didn't do any uh, kind of metagenomics, it's very expensive. <laughs> um, but uh, one way we could eventually look at it would be to use um, programs that try to infer function from 16S. So things like CaproTax um, or tax refund. So that's a possibility. We haven't done it. Um, I suspect that the abundant communities, which are kind of find, like found in a lot of places, um, you might see slightly different functions, but it, because you have such a big difference between the number of plexa, those differences might actually be kind of lost in the number. So you might want to look at um, functions differently into specific, um, like phylum or classes of um, bacteria. So, Nestle Han, is the metagenomics approach allowing you to? start to address this yeah so uh you know just it actually is a you know just easier with the genomes to be able to take a look at these because you know just you take a look at what's abundant and uh, then you can just simply zoom in to their functions so uh but that also has uh, certain limitations of course especially with uh, metagenome assembled mags it depends how complete your genome uh, is in that sense so that you do not necessarily miss something um, but um, uh, you know, just with those caveats in mind, uh, actually, uh, rare taxa was not really performing rare functions in uh, 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 the study that we conducted, at least. Uh, so uh, you know, just more rare fun uh, you know, uh, taxa uh, might have been having the same properties uh, to the common ones in here. Uh, that only uh, applied most of the carbon cycle. Uh, on the other hand, um, uh, nitrogen uh, is a bit more uh, localized, and uh, there you, we could see the importance of maybe rarer uh, uh, metagenome assembled mags in, uh, in respect to the remainder of the community. Yeah. Okay, I think there's one more that we have time for here. Uh, and this is a more broader one of 
of basically revealing new found molecular diversity in polar microbiome, but also how climate change is affecting extremophile microbes, perhaps due to their narrow temperature ranges. So are there research programs in place to assess the metabolic and molecular diversity in the Arctic as it's affected by climate change? And what kind of opportunities do these rapid environmental changes provide to polar microbiologists? Well, I think so actually... I can jump in right in, at least from, uh, you know, just, uh, uh, from my institutional perspective. So uh, yes, in uh, at least in the United States, uh, there are several large programs. One of it is the one that I'm also in. It's called Next Generation Ecosystem Experiments in the Arctic. This is an, uh, a multi-institution uh, department of energy uh, initiative that studies various aspects of uh, Arctic uh, ecosystems from hydrology to biogeochemistry to microbiology, trying to create an integrated view to the uh, responses of Arctic to changing uh, global temperatures. Yeah. And, and uh, I think the same with Europe as well. There, are, I know, are multiple programs specifically yes. looking at these questions. Yes. And and clearly, yeah, it's it's the the very rapid change and the concern with this that's driving driving this very much. Yes. So I have one final question, and it's partly a lead in to our next webinar. Uh, Neslin, you mentioned antibiotic resistant teas. Yeah. Why? I mean, yes, you can find them, but why do you think yeah. they're there? Uh, so uh, that is a question also, uh, you know, just is on my mind uh, in a more ecological perspective. Uh, we uh, saw them as, uh, you know, just, uh, actually we didn't know why they are existing there. We just reported in this particular paper because uh, they're particularly interesting in the managing their immediate environments. So because our main finding in this particular paper was that, you know, just there might be a, a need in permafrost to manage your environment to get your nutrients and resources. Uh, there might be an argument to be made that maybe you really need to be ready to fight for them. So, uh, and you know, just and to be able to resist uh, whatever uh, uh, other agents around you. So we uh, saw the antibiotic resistance from uh, that perspective. Basically, they really had to have these genes to be able to, uh, you know, just uh, have a niche in this ecosystem to themselves. Well, thank you. And this is, of course, a nice lead into our next webinar on August 6th on the environmental dimension of antibiotic resistance. Uh, also, how they're naturally found, but also, of course, how antibiotic use is driving antibiotic resistance genes. So please tune in to, to that in two weeks. I think we need to wrap up. Uh, there are a few questions still left that were not answered. We're going to try to get to those offline. Uh, and again, if you missed sections or somebody else you know who didn't uh, get a chance to tune in, uh, this uh, webinar has been recorded and will be posted probably early next week. So it's available to view again. And with that, I want to thank our three wonderful speakers, Tuani, Lucy, and Nestle. And thank you so much for your time and uh, leading uh, uh, into to your insights on the topic. And I want to thank everybody in the audience. We had actually a really good group of people from all over the world that I was noticing, seeing, and actually some some uh, good good colleagues and friends in the audience as well. So thank you everyone for tuning in and uh, we'll see you in two weeks for the next FEMP webinar. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.